Welcome to Death and World Grounding. I'm here with philosopher uh, and uh, general general scholar, a YouTube YouTube philosopher, Johannes uh, Niederhauser, and we are going to be talking about death. We are going to be talking about Heidegger. We're going to be talking about philosophy um, and its relationship to our life world, its relationship to um, grounding a world. What does it mean to ground a world today? Um, I just want to do a little bit of opening and context uh, and also sort of... Um, I guess a a checking in because in some of these uh, philosophy conversations I've been doing, you know, it, it takes like five or ten minutes to sort of like settle into like the deepest philosophical questions we could possibly answer. It's like, you know, it just takes a moment to to, to just uh, relax into the space. And um, I think some important context for the viewers is that like. Um, you know, I, I I met you in I met you in in person last year, um, and the context in which I sort of reached out to you was very relevant to this conversation, actually, because I, I came across one of your videos on your your book, your dissertation, um, Heidegger uh, on on death and being, and while i was while i was listening to your to your overview on that book i was actually you know struggling with with coronavirus and and like just absolutely destroyed so i was like in the in the in the depths of wrestling with 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 i guess finitude and mortality feeling just totally empty uh and i was just listening to you talk about you know the utter non-availability of <laughs> of, of, of of death and 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 the way you conceptualized it really resonated with me um so i so i wanted to reach out and also um you know in the subsequent months on reflecting on your work and and um how you approach heidegger um it was also very therapeutic for me because i, I was also going through a, a death in the family of someone very close to me um and as often happens with death it it can destroy families and it can break people apart um and it and it certainly did for me so i'm just first very excited to to have an extended conversation with you um on this live um and uh second just very um very grateful for your work and 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 very it's been very helpful for me and um yeah that's that that's that's sort of a, a an intro for me so so welcome johannes thank you very much dr cadell last i think we should be very formal no so we're good to see you dr johannes um, yes <laughs> and uh very good to see you again. We had a couple of walks around Finsbury Park. That's right, yeah. Yes. Yeah, February, I think, mostly March. Just before you left. Yeah. Also yeah. for to see uh to come back to your family, I think it was. Yeah, and, my grandfather, yeah. my grandfather had passed, yeah, or was was in the process of passing. I I luckily had a chance to be with him for a, a week before his actual death. Yeah, and then I think we we stayed in touch, and always we tried to record something during our time in London, but never worked out. So we have to do it over whatever this is now. But very good that we can finally do it. Um, yeah, I, as you mentioned, I wrote a thesis or a dissertation, and now book on Heidegger and death and being for i don't know i read heidegger on my own um so i didn't have any say formal university education or so 
on Heidegger. I bought Being in Time in 2010 mm -hmm. when I was a student of economics in Italy and read the book and did not, probably still not, but back then really didn't understand anything. Um, but what crystallized over about, a, it took me about three years or so to, to read it for the first time. And what I kind of see though, is that death is central to being in time. And I wanted to understand why, because I hadn't expected anything like this in the book before I read it. And it turned out then when I actually applied for the PhD, I hadn't read that much more about Heidegger uh, or by him, except for a few things on <clears throat> technology, what everybody else is reading, you know. But it turned out then the more I read that death is spread out across his entire thinking path and not just mentioned aside, but very, very critically in relationship with with the Ereignis or with the so-called history of being, with science Geschichte, with technology as a response to technocracy, you could say. And um, also, and that may be very specifically with the fourfold, given that the title for, for this dialogue is World Grounding and the fourfold being his response to the technological unworld or non-world and the possibility or so to, well, oh, the, the question of what it means to be human, maybe I'll leave it at that for now, but this is deeply related for Heidegger, especially the later Heidegger, to the question of, or the phenomenon of death and our being mortal, which is not just an existential truism or so, right, or it's just a biological fact, but is itself, we speak with Rilke, a dimension uh, which we're in, but which we have to specifically respond to and be able to dwell in, you could say. Yeah. Um, specifically this notion of, of dwelling in death um, as something that makes us human. And the idea that in being in time, you sort of make the point in your analysis of being in time, you sort of make yeah. the point that this book is, you know, again, in counter to the existentialist sort of truism, it's kind of like saying, it's like a blind spot of modernity, this this dimension of death, like that we, we actually have to dwell within death in order to be human. And that this is, this is sort of, somehow exploit like both concealed and exploited by the modern project is that is it like is is that is that an accurate description of what you think it being in time is trying to to point out to us because being it's yeah go on sorry go on yeah just sorry. just because because when i think about the modern project I mean, it, it, it obviously cuts us from our traditional roots. Um, in some sense, it creates a radical divide between our family, communal, intimate sphere and our more professional development or our intellectual development. And it, it sort of casts a scientific zeitgeist over the world. And in my sort of own personal development as a sort of professional scientist and so forth, I, I sort of found myself caught up in an ideology which did kind of have immortality as its main telos. So it, so it rings true to me. Like it, it rings true to me that, that, that what being, if being in time is saying something like the modern project has as its sort of concealed, at its concealed core, it's really um, striving for a form of immortality um, and at the same time preventing a dwelling in death, which might have a relationship to our inability to be human. Mm -hmm. I think so, not. Does I've taken a lot of notes, but so 
Heidegger, I think Heidegger himself does not yet foresee what we now is what, what calls itself transhumanism. So Heidegger does not even when Heidegger has some you know really crass remarks about the future of the human being, where he does say human beings will be produced in factories and they will be produced uh, as according how to how they are required by the operations of Gestell. So they will be intelligent and stupid people, uh, you know, and it can be the way in which art, for example, is produced or poetry or novels, they can be produced for a certain type of human being that's then specifically produced for that consumption of that. So he goes into all of this, but he never sees, I think, at least to my knowledge, anything that already points towards the attempt of becoming immortal. That's something that uh, that you can now that we can now see with with this ex becoming explicit of transhumanism and some of its ideas or projects about mortality and we can tie this back in with we don't have to do this now but with heidegger's critique for example of humanism itself so the question is of course what kind of a human being wants to become or needs to become even immortal maybe it is that 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 type of a human being that um needs to become um that only sees the human being at the center and therefore has nothing um, beyond it, but uh, a reification or a deification also of itself. But with so Heidegger himself does not yet see this. I go into this in the in, in the book. If anyone's interested in the third part, which is on technology, why technology though? Reading Heidegger, but against which against the our situation now, why technology or Gestell has to work against death. Um, precisely because death is the non-available. Heidegger does not call death the non-available either. If you if you want to go into to being in time briefly, what being in time does, and this is where then this is you know this meets with what you were just saying about the modern project, the cutting off from roots, etc. The the run up to being in time for Heidegger is his time in Marburg, where he's in touch with uh, the neo-kantians who are also all aware of the crisis of modernity as is his other teacher husserl and heidegger gives a lecture course i think in 1925 on the history of time or the history of the concept of time and there he responds to descartes and he says that the the dictum Ego cogito sum is this formula is almost meaningless. And if any formula are allowed or should be should be used at all, then it should be sum moribundus. I am insofar as I am towards my death. The way in which then death is introduced there, and especially then also in being in time, death is thought of as the own most possibility that that limits and at the same time frees the human being. So there's an utmost possibility which itself cannot be actualized, which itself gives nothing to actualize to the human being, is in that sense utterly unavailable, but for that inavailability gives rise to all the other possibilities um, of factual existence. And so you can already see that here's there's an attempt here to push out the ego from within its enclosedness in subjectivity back out into the world through or with death. Um, because it's only in this towardness, of course, also towards birth. Heidegger does not forget birth. Uh, birth is also mentioned towards the end of being in time. Um, but it is precisely because death itself is impending. There is no time point to it. Uh, it cannot be measured when, but it is always impending in that sense of uh, of something that could occur at any moment, but never in that sense even quite is or does occur fully uh, for us. And yeah, so and and it, what happens though in being a time for Heidegger is that in his 
diagnosis of death and this withdrawal that occurs here. So at, at once, Dasein comes in touch with its most intense being, with, with the highest intensity of, of its being, because it realize, Dasein begins to begin to see who we are, who we could be, etc. But at the same time, of course, there's a withdrawal, right? There's, there's, it, it, it's, you're, you're already then under the threat of, of death and, uh, and, and, and collapse, etc. But here, I think Heidegger makes the experience that it's being itself that withdraws in a certain way or is not ever fully available. And that's anti-modern, if you like, if you want to label it like this. Because modernity, this is Heidegger, will begin to understand metaphysics in modernity, in our late modernity, is that we try scientifically to make available something according to its beingness. You know, the, we become data, we become genetic data, and through that making available of genetic data, we, you, you can build or construct a human being according to the needs of the market, um, et cetera. But what Heidegger will like to point out is that we are it's impossible to make anything, even just only in a momentary sense, yes, but not in this timeless sense that the sciences are trying uh, to do. So, yeah. Yeah, there's so much there. <laughs> it's like, where, like, what, what, what thinking path am I gonna unfold here? Um, so, like, I guess a few. One, I like, I, I really like this way Heidegger is playing with cogito ergo sum. Yeah, I am in so far as I am towards my death. Um, and that this is somehow connected with a more intense being than the than than the being that that we typically think and and i don't know it just it it reminds me of so many things it reminds me of when my when my when my grandfather passed a, a, a week before he passed he had a had a heart attack and a near death experience and he described it as a hyper intense being. I mean, we could we could say. I mean, it reminded me. I he I had him describe for me what the experience was like, and I mean, I think it was kind of like an archetypal or stereotypical near death experience where where there was just a really bright, intense light, and his ego identity was just shredded. You know, but but he wasn't describing like an absence of consciousness. Like he wasn't describing an absence of consciousness. He was describing an intensity of consciousness. He was describing an intensity of experience. And it also reminds me of how I've listened to a lot of yogis over the last two years. And I remember one of them was saying um, as sort of like a philosophical or personal exercise to uh, go to a, a, a mortality ward or go to a, go to a, a go to a, a ward of people who are close to death yeah, you know, yeah. So, that, so that you can sort of experience what it's like to be around someone who's actually close to the end and so that you can sort of have a, a different perspective on on your own life uh, as something that's sort of like um worth doing mo mostly what I'm trying to push towards here is mostly worth doing to break out of your own enclosedness because it's so easy to get trapped into your own ego so trapped into your own enclosedness and that that again just this this notion that a being towards death is simultaneously something that can help you become reborn um i wonder if there's anything there for you because also um when my granddad had his near death experience and then he had a week left of life the 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 day or two after the near death experience he felt reborn like for a day or two like for a day or two he felt reborn like he was like i'm going to go play golf like i i just got I'm, you know like, <laughs> so so there was just this aliveness that was there and, and so um 
you know, what it makes me think is that in order to combat, like, and I'm, I'm sort of like reflecting on my own ego as well, like how easy it is to become enclosed, self-enclosed, that in order to become reborn, one has to be close to death, that there's a connection, but there's, there's a, there's a connection between breaking oneself open and being reborn. You can take it even beyond just the personal. What Heidegger's entire project is about, and necessarily so, because of what he sees as, and others, as, as the utter crisis of the sciences, meaning a collapse of categories by which the sciences can even make sense, not that they've answered that question by this day, you know, which is why they want to shoot themselves to Mars. Um, it's just a yeah, but, but so the, the, the project is the transformation of the human being from, from the beginning. Uh, and so, and, and that transformation is, is one. So if you like a rebirth of the human outside of the enclosement of subjectivity, which can easily lead to subjectivism or even solipsism, which is a bit, you know, subjectivity is, uh, not yet subjectivism, but can, of course, lead down that uh, paranoid path. Uh, and that, that, is, uh, that is the project. So it is one that, is, that, that, that shoots, that is that the shoots Dasein, the human being, out of itself by showing that it's even just the, the, what, what, what's referred to as the subject-object dichotomy, this collapse between you, you, you said modern project cuts us off from our roots, from our relationships too. That's another way of saying the subject-object dichotomy, where we find access back to so-called nature only through um, an objectific objectification of nature and ourselves as well, and also pre-formatting of everything. Right? There's there's a strange attempt of of me to speak in Hegelian language uh, <laughs> by by ordinary consciousness, right? Because Cadell is about to teach a course on the phenomenology of spirit in Hegel, a very significant book where he, Hegel goes through the ordinary consciousness of, of, uh, of, of modernity. And I do think, by the way, that Hegel, you know, uh, is not, is, I think he was aware. <laughs> I think he knew that something was up uh, and that we were not just gloriously marching to ever greater freedom. Because in the introduction to that book, he says, there's a there's a new time that's coming, and the sign for that is silliness and boredom. And as you know, in the earlier text, he speaks of diremption, the end zweiung. Right? It's a very it's a very strong word, the end zweiung of, of spirit with itself. Um, by the way, the way in which just by terms of in terms of association, the way in which you said Zeit, the zeitgeist, right? It almost sounded like the zeitgeist is a specter, uh, and the German word geist can have this meaning. Of a specter, it's not the only meaning, but it certainly can have some <laughs> that meaning also. Uh, but yeah, the, the the project really is to to move um, to also as Hegel, as you know, you, you know better than I. Uh, the full life is attained only for the spirit that has uh, moved through death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very different than Heidegger. I think we can get to this at yeah. some point. Uh, Heidegger is, I would say, more radical. Uh, because he sees more of a need for it, right? For negativity, more of a need than Hegel can. This is not so. I'm not this. I'm not a, a Cambridge boy, you know. He's wrong, blah blah blah. In abstract, abstract terms, I think Hegel cannot yet see that even more radical necessity for concealment and negativity that becomes obvious to Heidegger. Positivism was not yet uh, a fully established uh, enterprise. Yeah. yeah. Um, Oh, that really hardcore attempt at making everything available in a full-on resource. And that only, so right, so with, with one thing we should always know with, with Heidegger is here you have someone who, who was born into an uh, agricultural landscape, but then sees all of technology, all the machines come in. And he Hegel did not yet, there was no car when Hegel was writing. None of this was yet... Oh. I, so, I think there are so many things that Hegel can't think. I mean, and, and I think Hegel would be the first one to admit that, also because absolute knowledge is is for I mean one's one's time, right? 
Like there's so many things that Hegel can't like. I mean, there's so many things that that, that Hegel's limited by his own his own historicity. I mean, and and yeah. well, and I, and I was just just gonna say that. I mean, I have no. Uh, I mean, well, mo most mostly uh, in terms of needing more negativity. I'm uh, I'm never 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 against that. So I mean, if if Heidegger's calling for more negativity and sees the need for that, I think that that's. I mean something that that i i think i try to call forth in in my work as well so i would be with heidegger in that sense but there's this um this project this you're saying the heideggerian project is is one that's really focused on the human itself and we can find it at this location of the breaking the breaking free of the enclosement with death and rebirth that that how how would that become how would that become grounded like how how like and and in in relationship to scientific modernity what i see is that there's um a way in which we become systematically encased like it could be in bureaucracies we become systematically encased in bureaucracies. Um, we become systematically encased in certain ideologies. Um, whether we want to identify, for example, like if we just take the 20th century as an example, um, we might become encased within communism. We might become encased within capitalism. We might become encased within fascism. We might become in contemporary language. There's a lot of ideological wars, identity wars. So we might become encased within feminism. We might become encased within a certain racial identity. We might become, in... but the human project he Heidegger saying is something that is a constant dying and being reborn, which involves being able to hold a certain intensity of being. Is that is, is that pointing in 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 yeah, you in could the say that direction yeah, that yeah. he's 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 pointing. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, on <laughs> yeah, there's a note somewhere where he says that the, what is the human being today? He's the victim of a fi of the filing cabinet, or of the file, um, and of the multiple registers and surveys that are and that are circling around him, are circling around the human being. Right. Um, yeah, and this you know encasement. Or so, as you know, one of the standard translations from yeah. many decades ago for Heidegger's notion of Gestell in German, which is difficult to translate, is and framing. Um, and there's, there's, there's different ways of thinking about this, but um, the, the what's <clears throat> what 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 <laughs> what Gestell attempts to achieve is a full Full. This is why Heidegger turns to cybernetics at some at later. A full encircling of of all human activity, so that everything is sucked into it and controlled by it without having without there being any central control mechanism, right? Or or not or or organ. There's no one. Uh, there who who uh well there will be there will be people who profit etc but there's no one there in the driver's seat um and what ultimately though the the what gestell has to strive to what what it has to work towards is to make the human being as this peculiar being in in somewhere in the twilight in between where we are the ones who turn everything into a resource, including ourselves. That so ultimately the the entirety of what it means to be human has to be has to become a preformatted, uh, uh, um, almost like a uh, you know it's 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 a, it's an a priori decision about what it means to be human. Uh, and there's formats or certain, well, <laughs> boxes, let's say, 
Um, and it it becomes something though that that is that is ultimately it's it's deeply anti-human. It, it wants to generate a human life or being that is without any of the fundamentally human experience. It knows no tragedy. It knows uh, it knows no tragedy. It knows no failure. It knows um, no losing. It knows no falling. And yeah, it's it, it generates a, a, a really strange sense of this timelessness. Is, you could say, yeah. This is the opposite of this is the opposite of becoming human. And made. <laughs> when you say tragedy, failure, losing, falling, I mean, I think like and I and I think like there's so much of yeah, so much of the institutional structuring of our world, which. Yeah, it does want to create this image of no catastrophe. It does want to create this image and and the ego also strives for yeah. success and winning. Like it wants to succeed and win. Like I I, I when I when I analyze my own ego, it like it's it's like it, I think the structure of it, it it wants to succeed and win and it wants to be the center of control. Whereas I think what you're pushing towards in in this yeah. reading is yeah. is kind is kind of the opposite um and also sort of in relationship to some other work you've done on which i think is really important actually to think is the relationship between heidegger and cybernetics is that cybernetics is a science of control communication and control yeah um but it's it's ultimately the type of project that Heidegger's working on is a type of it, it's a world a world where it's it's not that things are in disorder but but like you're saying no one's in the driver's seat so like there's like an there's an order would you can you say there's an order that would be perceived by the human subject as chaos well yeah I mean, the, <laughs> you you <laughs> you can understand this intense will to control everything, down to its molecular genetic uh, level, through all kinds of communication. Right, communication does not just need to be between human beings. You can have different kinds of messaging services. Um, <laughs> that 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 is already an indication. That's that something has is that it's 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 already outside this intense absolute will to control it's there's something already breaking away and i think you know we can i don't want to illustrate it too much because i'm uh, you know you're you're a hegelian so you know we shouldn't we should be we should be scared or shy away from too much representational thinking and make everything too illustrative but you know, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm already I'm already not a Hegelian. No, no, <laughs> yeah. No, but just <laughs> no, no. Sorry, sorry. I didn't want to call no, you no, Hegelian, but, yeah, but, but but that's precisely the point, right? But, like, but as a reader of Hegel, or you know, for for Heidegger, yeah, for Heidegger, you know, a reader of Heidegger as well, like me, uh, you, you get um, you don't want to give too many illustrations, but Nick Land says the future is unevenly distributed, and it could be that what uh what Heidegger foresaw in technology, which was intensely disturbing to the people of his time, is now becoming more obvious because it was prescient in a way that only poets and thinkers can foresee something. There's also something strange about our time, I just want to say this, is that we are extremely concerned with the future. And this was not the case before modernity. There is something strange about this. I'm reading a very fascinating book at the moment, Mary Shelley's The Last Man. She's the author of Frankenstein. This is one of her lesser known novels, where, by the way, um, this is about the end of humanity, which is set in the 21st century, written, I think, in 1818 or 1820 or so. Um, so there, there is something in the air, right, where we could say there's something really uncanny. What, what Science fiction novels, where's this coming from? Mm -hmm. um, what, what are they? Are they just, you know, anxieties of, 
of the immediate past and the present projected into the future? No, because yes, sometimes they they envision the future in a ridiculous way and it turn, doesn't turn out this way, but maybe they are something much more uncanny. Maybe, maybe there are memories of the future, right? And now, well, now it gets a bit spooky, yeah. um, but that's fine. That's why we do this on YouTube and not in the inside academia because they, they would be haunting, hunting us down for this. Um, but so what I think is, is uh, to come back to your other point, uh, and, and that, by the way, that, that could lead to chaos itself if you remember something that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but what this utter in, intense will to control maybe this this plays or betrays is 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 that there is an anarchy of chaos there's an anxiety like if you want to control something there might there might be an underlying anxiety like of things of of identity changing I, well like of, of, of identity yeah. becoming other okay but i wouldn't put it i wouldn't put it in psychological terms okay that's not how so that's not how i understand I, I so there's something in say being itself that is shifting in such a tremendous way uh which which pretends to give order but it, it's it's a it's an it's a chaotic anarchy and this will become i think more and more <laughs> visible for anyone who's not completely gone in this decade that um you know what you're supposed or allowed to do is changing on a daily basis for example right with the covid measures uh what you're supposed or allowed what is in, what is normal human behavior is now no longer allowed um so th there's really weird uh, uh developments right now where you can kind of see um something fundamental now shifting that's probably occurred a bit earlier um and it's coming to the fore now that something is at work that is, I think, tremendously anti-human. By the way, the word anarchy, we don't have to understand this politically. The word arche means origin. An arche, anarchy, is that which is anti-origin, anti-primordial ground. One of your questions before that I haven't responded to yet um, was how, how does this find grounding? Yeah. And and that's how does something the, we can get how does into the as project? Because well. so there's this pro, so there's there's this project which involves yeah I'd imagine I'd imagine it would have to in, involve some sort of sk dialectical skill of of breaking apart and reforming, dying and being reborn, which certain subjects would be able to handle at a higher level than other subjects. Like I probably wouldn't be able to handle the amount of dying and being reborn that I can handle now that I maybe could have when I was 10 or 15 or something like that. But that there's a, but at the same time, adults sort of need more contact with the death and birth of everyday life. And that we're the type of beings, human beings, or you want to say the spirit or the soul that we're the type of beings, human beings that could withstand that type of breaking apart and being reborn because we're the thing that dies and is reborn. But that, okay. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. I want to just that, that, that yeah, it, yeah. just that, that the, the ground, the ground in that situation would be the, the, the spirit or the core of the human. Like that, that would be, I'm just trying to search, search where, where is the, the, the ground? I think maybe we, we cannot give any immediate answer. It's not the human being. I think probably that's where, humanism or humanitarianism also then goes astray and, and probably precipitates or almost necessitates transhumanism um for a, let's just say for a loss of transcendence or any any loss of limitation to what the human being can um can be limited by but it's perhaps what's first re required or necessary 
is a is is an acceptance of the withdrawal of ground in our time that there is for now a, an absence of the divine um, an absence or withdrawal of sense of orientation of meaning right it's it's in one word it's a nihilistic time as Nietzsche says nihilism will be will be the history for the next 200 years um and that experience of of withdrawing ground does not mean it's everything collapses and this is the decline of all declines but that what becomes necessary through this initial acceptance and by the way this has you know we if, if this is too abstract let's just speak of institutions you and i both we have left i'm not going to speak for you but we've, we've left uh, academia for certain reasons um uh, an institution that at least i uh, do not see much hope for um and that that is a certain withdrawal of a massive institution that sustained uh, civilization for a thousand years um and that though to accept and to see or to affirm almost also right that there is an an absence of ground that necessitates the need to ground again or to 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 enact grounding as it were okay. but this is so, a, yeah make sorry, go let, let me let me jump in here so so when i was in undergrad when i entered undergrad i had the presupposition that i was going to try and become a professor I guess what was in that presupposition was that the institution of the university represented a type of ground for my being. Mm -hmm. That that I, I presupposed that my being would be contained by this structure. Now I quickly realized only a few years into my undergrad yeah. that this was unlikely. Um, I had the intuition which then became a motivation for a lot of my later work that we were going to undergo a radical systemic change like a met what i would call i ca i called it in my phd a, met a meta system transition which would involve a collapse of institutions and a rebirth of institutions in a different form And that that had something deeply related to do with our time, namely the the emergence of the internet and the you know all the, the all the new technology that that we're we're going on about now. Yeah. Now. Now, I don't see my ground in any institution outside of me, and I guess I'm not trying to find any ground for an institution outside of me. What I'm trying to do is find, I'll just talk personally. I, what I'm trying to do is find a ground within me, which is not my ego, but which is something that endures the death and the rebirth of my ego. And when I, when I read, for example, I'll, I'll, maybe we can bring some points of contact here between Heidegger and Hegel, because I'm, I'm going to read for some points of contact, um, some quotes from the phenomenology of spirit where Hegel talks about what I take to be something close to absolute knowing, which is a pure, here's a quote, pure self-recognition and absolute otherness as an ether. That this pure self-recognition and absolute otherness as an ether is the opposite of a self-enclosed circle which he calls not astonishing, saying basically these self-enclosed circles are not astonishing, and that it is the tremendous power of the negative, the energy of thought, the pure I. And he says that the loc so I think so. Here's mm -hmm. how I'm thinking about it. So there's yep. this there's this circle which is self-enclosed and defends itself and encases itself, 
Yeah. And then what I'm thinking is that the 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 ontology or the the the, the being, let's say no, the say the being of this circle is actually that it can never completely close on itself. Mm -hmm. If it closes on itself, it's just a pseudo closure. Mm -hmm. That the place where it can't close itself is the non-actuality. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. place of where it can't close on itself is death. So later he's in the next line he says death equals the non-actuality what the self-enclosure finds the most dreadful and in order to endure it one has to have the greatest strength so that's and then he says the life of the spirit is not the life that shrinks from death untouched by devastation but the life that endures it and maintains itself in it and wins its truth and so forth these are famous lines from passage 32 or whatever yeah. But so what I'm what I'm trying to get to is that in sort of recognizing this these self enclosures, recognizing that they are repetitions which are not astonishing, they're repetitions which are just mimics. They're mimic. They're 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 they're, they're repetitions that are just based on image imitate, Im, Im, imitating mim, mimicking other people. Yeah. They're being used to defend themselves against truth because the truth is the fact that the circle can't close. So they become shallow, they become hollow, they become empty in a bad sense. And that by going into the negativity, and here I would be with Heidegger, more and more negativity is needed. To go into the negativity, that you have the possibility to sort of win yourself. And that that is a stable ground. Um, what 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 do you think of that logic? Well, is it a stable ground? Well, it's a stable ground in 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 otherness. Like it's 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 basically how I how I understand it is that yeah. how I okay. So how I understand it is you include otherness or you include difference or you include surprise into yourself to such a degree yeah. that it, it's self-similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, like, okay, so I, let me use a crazy, ridiculous example. So this is what I've said before is like a subject of absolute knowing would be able to go to sleep one night, wake up in the morning, and be in a completely different universe with different physical laws and be kind of, yeah. Like, like, like in some sense, still self-similar with itself. Like had had to such a to such a degree included otherness within itself. But the question, so when Heidegger will say, to answer with Heidegger, what Heidegger says about that passage on death in the phenomenology is that it is all too integrated. Okay. So that no catastrophe, and he uses the uh, Greek spelling for the word, is possible. That there's no incision that's possible, or no cut, or catastrophe in a literal sense means something like a, a turning that is sent from far away or from above so it's it's almost too integrated it, it, it doesn't become serious with death it's not this moment of so yeah he actually you know he, he calls it non-actuality which metaphysical parlance is close to possibility uh it's somewhere between the possible and the actual i suppose for him for hegel and i do understand but the and i would go along with it but the question is wouldn't that you know, isn't 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 the cybernetic circuit one that actually encompasses uh, the, the its own uh, sort of its at uh, certain dialectics, right? Uh, any kind of discourse that you have now is pro and anti. Just look out for that. You know, there's nothing in between anymore, and it's it it feels steered, uh, not because there's anyone steering it, but there's a certain strange way in which this always comes up. Right in the UK, you can be pro or against Brexit. There's, there's, there's nothing in between, and it, it's and it, it'll it'll steer its way in this exact way. 
um, according. So the question is, is not cybernetics integrating negativity or negative feedback loops into its overall um, attempts of control and reinforcement so that they actually become necessary, right? As a, to, to release pressure or so, do you see? Um, so when you're saying that the, what, how, how, so if, if so is, is he saying this, the idea of absolute knowing is still presupposing a type of symmetry or self-similarity is that is that what he means by too integrated and not not accepting enough the catastrophe yeah is it too much symmetry is it too much self similarity yeah so i i think that... in this yeah and that goes very deep into the heideggerian way of thinking where um it okay. is usually assumed that heidegger is a philosopher of difference right now or difference etc cetera, etc cetera. uh but uh Heidegger tries to get rid of any notion of, of similarity or so entirely, but we don't have to go there now. But yes, so to stay with this, yes. Um, okay, so, the, the, the sudden turning, so the, the, the sudden turning, is the sudden turning possible, as in the sudden turning of someone who was freed in the liberated or freed in, the, in Plato's cave, that sudden turning of the head and then walking outside. Is, is that suddenness one, something that is in the cards here, or is that then not integrated into that fullest life of the spirit? Sorry, so so you can you can you, re can you repeat yeah. can you repeat the notion of the the so I, I have been um, thinking a lot about this this sudden turning also not just uh, motivated by your your recent discussions on Plato's cave but also. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, some work that Daniel Garner's been doing on Plato's Cave and sort of this, the question of motivation when it comes to why someone would um, basically uh, uh, turn their back on the shadows mm -hmm. uh, and 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 live a life of live a life of truth. Are you saying this this sudden turning towards the light in Plato's Cave is related to what Heidegger's talking about in? getting rid of similarity maybe yeah go on yeah yeah so just trying to trying 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 to get at what, what so I, I was trying to articulate that absolute knowing yeah. does bring us to a type of notion of symmetry with otherness or symmetry with difference and you're saying that heidegger's developing a philosophy of difference that gets rid of any type of similarity and that the sudden turning or the motivation in in Plato's cave is connected to this. Is that is that? Yeah. Correct? So so, well, yeah, we can. Yeah, and and also, it, it, but so maybe a better translate translation for it, unter sheet is uh, not difference, but something like cut or chasm. Um, and and I think also you know this this is a certain you can play with it a bit. Maybe we do this for now. A sudden cut. With the trajectory of modernity and a sudden cut of with the entire tradition that builds up for heidegger to cybernetics but at the same time not one that is like the italian movement of the of futurism which wants to which uh, cut everything off and just live in 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 a war of the future of speed and and high warlike intensity and driving on the autostrada, the highway, and shooting bombs, etc., uh, without burning down Rome and pouring concrete over it. Um, so not that kind of a cut with the tradition, but a cut that is one which knows that this, this has run its course. And what is now to be done is to salvage from the wreckage what is worthy of being saved and necessary also because it... And, and read, so to read the texts again, but now outside their overcome <clears throat> um, metaphysical uh, um, notions or, or ways of understanding them for the past two and a half thousand years. 
because and I think this is where Heidegger is really strong. He sees he says this 50 years ago. He says, "What is philosophy? Or 60 years ago, what is philosophy now capable of? It's what it's. It, there will be philosophy," he says. There will, it won't die in the institutions, but it will just be uh, epigonal renaissances, right? And this is how you get to where we are now. You have new realism, then you have new Aristotelianism. So you've got all these isms that are announcing themselves as new, they're new programs, they're reviving something. But in what sense? But they're not our own. I mean, this question is really one, what is it that is our own, where we, we don't just regurgitate? Speaking of the cave, basically what this is, is having shadows on a cave that makes sense for a while, and then that trend collapses again, and the next trend comes along, the next is in the next new program. Uh, but our question should be, what is it that speaks to us in what sense genuinely um and then we're then we're back with the question of grounding in a gen, in a, in a genuine sense right because that that could ground us but as i said before what needs to be experienced first and taken seriously is the withdrawal of that ground if not we just continue to build on on quicksand okay so <laughs> maybe so so what so let me okay let, let I'll take it I'll take it one one step at a time. So in terms of the withdrawal of the ground I have accepted that all of the the institutions or all of the normative structures that I thought might provide a ground for my being when I was growing up yeah need to be rethought fundamentally. So that that is that that would be the withdrawal of the ground. We could take it there, yeah. Okay, okay. we could. That's one way of saying it. That's one way of saying it. Then, where to find, where to start to find a ground is in the. You said the difference, the cut, and the chasm. No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go difference, on. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Difference, yeah. cut, and chasm. something that breaks with the trajectory of modernity, the entire tradition that leads to cybernetics, which is a type of communication and control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, what the cut or, and here taking this from, from your reading of being in time, the cut or the the dwelling within is something related to death. So there's something really nice actually that you said in your your video on death and being that I want to quote here that, yeah. that might be related to death and the cut, which is to be ahead of all partings. Let's see. Let me just see if I've got it. Yeah, to be ahead of all parting and to be ahead of all wishing farewell. There's a cut, there's a dwelling in death. I like that. Um so there's the so like at least in my own so in my own self, yeah. There's this this withdrawal of the ground that I thought would be the being. Yeah. And there's a dwelling in the cut, which it's almost as if it's almost as if I'm I'm trying to imagine that I'm I'm already dead, like that it that that, that so like that the loss, the failure, the tragedy has happened. Mm -hmm. The loss, the failure, the tragedy has happened. Yeah. Inevitably, right? In inevitably. Now. Yeah. It's not, yeah. A, and, it, it, and that from there, I try to think. Yeah. So um, in Greek tragedy, Nietzsche is very strong on this, obviously, in the birth of uh, tragedy from the spirit of music. Uh, yeah. 
the the moment of the Danos in Greek. Danos is, I think, the ter the terrifying, the the horrifying, perhaps also let's just say terrifying, because then we don't have the notion of horror. Um, that shows itself at some point. It shows itself to Antigone. You know, it, it's not. There's no monster or anything coming from 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 the sea or so, right? It's it, it's the moment where the inevitable shows itself as utterly necessary. <clears throat> and in that, that's though that, that it's so it's not fatalism because it doesn't mean that now you, you're you're just supposed to let everything try. But no, you you become you're you're not just a spectator or an observer. You see what is necessary. And I think this is what Nietzsche means by amorphati also. But in this, so uh, an appreciation, an affirmation even of this, you take it to its necessary conclusion, but at the same time, you remain a thinking, per, such as a sensing being. You, you, and that can be a moment of freedom also. You go into a little, that a little bit more. You take it to its necessary. Con you, so you take you take this so, this moment of terror and horror to its necessary conclusion, but you remain a sensing being. Yeah, it's the not, way I, you, you don't. Yeah. yeah, go on, go on. The way the like the way the way I the way I think think about that is, um, also like maybe closely related to this this yogi advice that you you go to the the the, the ward where you, you're with people who are on their deathbed or something like that but it's 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 that moment yeah. like for example in, in 2017 my my father uh went to the doctor's office and was told that he has terminal cancer and that he has three months to live so this is an example that i use to think about this terror and horror that shows itself as a necessary conclusion. But in that moment, he broke open in terms of, again, being this sensing being. And now I'm, I'm using these examples of my grandfather and my, my father who yeah. unfortunately, yeah. I mean, confronted this, intense sensing being this intensity of emotion this intensity of experience upon confrontation with the necessary conclusion of their being i guess what i'm trying to say is i'm trying to advance the process within myself so that i've i'm like i'm i'm a healthy i'm well fingers crossed i'm a healthy man right now <laughs> <You know>? finger <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah nothing nothing's going wrong fingers crossed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, toast to that. But so, okay. but I'm but so in some sense, I'm healthy. I'm everything's functioning. Yeah, I'm sleeping okay. Everything's <laughs> working down there. Uh, everything's working up here. Uh, I'm my mental faculties are 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 for the most part working fine and so so forth. Um, but I'm trying to almost artificially, in some sense create the sensation in myself that my father felt from the external perturbation of going to the doctor's office and being told you have terminal cancer, not for no reason, for the reason that I want to be reborn anew, I think, to, to, to sense, to experience more intensely, to experience more deeply, and that, that, that whatever it is that is capable of dying and being reborn is how I'm trying to locate the ground. But in some sense, I admit or I would agree that yeah. there that there is a more radical unground, meaning like I do think that there's there's the event that will really destroy me. Like so for example, like so for example, uh I'll tell like in one of my ayahuasca experiences. I had the experience, well, ayahuasca, for people who don't know, ayahuasca is a psychedelic substance. It's like a drink from, look it up online if you don't know what it is. I had the experience of being totally ungrounded in like a black hole 
which opened up and swallowed me. And basically there was this, not a voice, but like I'm trying to communicate it as a voice of there will be an event that you will never be able to tell a story about. Like there, there will be an event that will just totally unground you, totally annihilate you. So, so, I'm, so, so I, so I would, so I would admit that there's an ungrounding that would just be is not self similar, is not symmetrical. So, yeah, but okay. that but while I'm alive. While I'm alive, there's this capacity to die and be reborn, which might be the location of possible so, new new society. Yeah, but if you take the if we take this seriously and to go beyond now psychology, etc., but on a on a you know ultimately uh, almost you know a planetary scale. Um, because let's not forget what we so what modernity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and the science is is something European and then American, and then gets exported and colonizes uh, the world, and also reshifts, um, you know, brings everything into one timeline, as it were, uh, brings everything into one historical process, uh, and and therefore homogenizes and flattens and, and crowds out what doesn't fit in with that to use your word encasement um but if if we so the the danger always is in our time to to try and optimize for it oh so i just integrate a bit more tragedy into my life or i have a bit more of this and then that will solve the problem no so i'll speak almost like a layman now there's no problem solving. This is this is not a technocratical issue, um, that, that that to which there is a solution. Um, we could <laughs> we could say that any attempts at problem solving at this point will exacerbate all the problems in the world. Um, it, it's th that's something to ponder about everything. Take this seriously. May if it's. In, indeed so that something has occurred the denos has shown itself the terrifying that we're not in charge that something is now running its course anything to either oppose it or optimize for it will exacerbate any issue that we have and this is maybe not what people want to hear but that's something that but the, the danger always is and even just on a psychological personal or so level is to try and optimize for something or replicate or simulate something. We, we, I think that we should very much stay away from that. I don't think we can. Uh, it, it either shows itself or it doesn't, but it cannot be enforced. And it can show itself. It doesn't have to be some, you know, groundbreaking, wonderful experience. It can be. It can occur when reading a certain text. That's what. Okay. So the 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 altern the alternate the alternative to thinking the alternative to thinking ground in because the alternative to thinking ground in 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 my thinking has been to try to think the genuinely alien to yeah. try to think to try to think the alien meaning to try to think the 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 totally other to try to think the thing that like it uh, well, and is that is that the meaning of this century is that the is the is the meaning of the is that the meaning of this century well, that that the, the 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 we're entering the totally other the totally alien? That's <laughs> maybe that's it. I don't know, uh, but at the same time, we would be it, it would be on many different levels. Given we're almost the same age, twenty four, <laughs> right? No, uh, we're mid thirties. <laughs> I'm thirty five. <laughs> yeah, thirty six. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're still young enough, um, but we're not yet really in charge. And there, are, there, there is a certain aspect of, 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 of an, of some of the older generations not wanting to step down, which is also telling because that leads us back to this incapacity or unwillingness to die, to be open to your own, uh, finitude. 
and make in their sense in that sense you know you speak about rebirth make make way for the birth of the next century etc but if this is i think if this is absolutely i mean i think this is probably very uh, accurate and terrifying at the same time that the utterly alien is upon us yeah uh, and you can you can think of you know you, you can think of this belief in in act in aliens like et etc as, as a reification right of the imagination yeah. of yeah. the alien and in terms of you know how let's let's have a let's have an object in our mind that we can envision and can, can agree on that's an that's an unalien but maybe there is something alien tragically alien terrifying showing showing itself without showing itself um and that's what, but at the same time we would be the we would be request we would be required to still in a sense make it our own or own up to it or live up to it in order not to lose our very being human what does that mean well because the the danger is to to alienate yourself from being human so much that you just want to become a machine or you just say well let's just give up it's the machines that take over so AI what is no, what is yeah. what is what so I, I i if i'm remembering correctly there's something in the beginning of being in time where he tries to critique yeah. the definitions of being human like where he's saying like we've been categorized as the rational animal like basically he was criticizing christian anthropology like I, yeah where, where nice. heidegger's yeah. or heidegger's qu qu uh, criticizing i think he mentions aristotle's labeling us of, of as the rational animal okay so like, let's go like into what, this like, what does yeah, it mean on. to remain human what does it mean to remain human that's my question in 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 the face of the utterly alien here we'll say okay. the artificial intelligence the new t new technology the totally different world so okay so we have to be so uh, to be very strict uh, Heidegger does not say uh, the labeling by Aristotle is wrong, and I, two and a half thousand years later, I'm right. This this is this kind of abstract, sorry, analytical philosophy approach to the so-called history of philosophy. Someone three thousand years ago was wrong. I get it right. No, what? So Aristotle never quite says that. This is something that's attributed to Aristotle. The so on logon echon. I don't. I'm not aware that Aristotle uses this exact phrase. So on logon echon, which is attributed to Aristotle a bit later, means something like the living being that holds himself in logos, or finds a stance, finds a ground, a grounding in logos. And logos is not dead formal logic, but is a living, breath breathing syllogism. We we can memorize recollect commemorate etc through the living breathing syllogism the hegel is very strong on this hegel revives this what happens though and this is the this is what hap this is what occurs throughout thought itself is it even the most this is something that rings true to the greeks in that particular moment and it becomes externalized, you could say, it becomes superficial when it's translated by the by the Latin translators of Aristotle and the texts surrounding Aristotle. When they translate so on log on echon as you know, not just um, the living being that finds its its stance and ground and hold in logos. No, they say rational animal or animal rationale in Latin. And the rational animal, therefore, is already a stifling of this initial experience. It's it's a copy. It's a, it's a you could say it leads to a simulacrum. And where we are now, because we've we've become so extremely superficial, we look at the human being as animal. That's the body. And the rational part attached to it, which is now, of course, reified as the brain. You've written a book on the brain, uh, so right? It's. We now, what transhumanism does is to split the rational part, some movements, with some currents within that movement. Um, it, it splits, so they, 
there's a splitting of the, say, the rational part, say the brain, which is then equivalent to the self, et cetera, completely deep uh, divided from the body. That's That can be imported or transported or uploaded to the cloud and made immortal, immortally available or in, indefinitely available there. So there's an externalization of what it means to be human, right? Uh, you, you, I don't know if, if there's anything else you want to mention from from Heidegger. What, what other uh, he, what other notion he has or criticizes of the human being? What what he does though is not so much say this is the wrong assumption about the human being. It's just does this even speak to us today? And then the question is, if that's not the case, then why is that the case? For Heidegger, it has to do with 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 translating something that was not an original experience, but at the same time, then what does it mean to be human? Well, for Heidegger, it does come back to being, being in a profound relationship with your death, with being mortal, but not just being mortal, but rather becoming mortal. And that's to say something more than just, you know, it's not a death cult. So we're not we're not meeting up and uh, want to die or so. Oh, we're, we, ready we're to not going to start a death. We're not going to we're not going to start a death cold. No, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. So, no I, so, okay. So I think so I think I, I think I think I let, let me, twenty seconds. Yeah. Sorry. To yeah. be to Heidegger has this this term I think in building dwelling thinking this sentence where he says they they are open to death as death that's a strange notion the mortals what does that mean i think that's how i've that's how i understood it might be wrong of course but death for heidegger becomes the con or is the concentration of concealment and non-availability which however gives rise to the beauty of the world that which is non-available is the more beautiful etc so if you're mortal in that sense you're open to that which is non-available and that is i think already a step outside the cybernetic circuit because the non-available makes no sense to the archive the archive the digital art archive etc that can only deal with what's available storable fileable manageable rehashable manipulable in that sense it doesn't know that which itself of course it can forget it's unaware of this, which is which is why it's very paranoid. But also, it cannot deal with that which is never made to be available, which can never be made available. Sorry. Now I rest my case, Doctor Last. Well, I know. I think. I think. No. I just. I think that it's 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 very in line with what I was trying to articulate. So, in terms of. So I think my question was something like what does it mean to remain human in the context of the emerging new whatever the otherness that might come in the 21st century and at yeah. least how at least how i was trying to frame it was that it it, it was it's in some profound relationship with death so it, in that sense, I, I feel like it's it's similar. It's it's a coming to being, more, becoming mortal in a, in a, in a in a very deep sense. So like like yeah. that. I mean, I'm just trying to reflect here, like my own path, like what I'm trying to do to become more human, not in this disembodied rationality of, like for yeah. example, in the transhumanist in the transhumanist worldview, you do have this telos which is pointing towards. A disembodied immortality like you have a telos that's pointing towards uploading yeah. you have but, a telos but, but that's look. pointing towards um yeah. <laughs> possibly being a, a technological being but and it like isn't you the telos imagine you're sorry it's not a telos it's it's a purely instrumental goal it's not because mm -hmm. it, it actually does not set a, a, a profound telos for Aristotle, book two, chapter two, metaphysics, is a peras. Those who do not know peras, limit, which, by the way, is what the idea is in Hegel, cannot know a genuine telos that's, that is, they, they don't know the nature of the good, he says. 
Okay. So I, I think I think that in I guess like in my own wrestling with trying to know the nature of the good, independent and I do I agree with that, like that in, in this instrumentalized goal of trying to become immortal. Yeah. They have this presupposition of a type of disembodied logos. And I think that they have oh, am I still Am I am I coming through clearly? I can hear you. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, okay. the 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 picture is yeah. Okay. So then, I think in order to remain human, I think it does have some relationship with this profound relationship with death. Yeah. Um. Now, I'm what I'm what I'm trying to think about is. I've seen how death shakes people to intense experiences at the end of their life. And I've seen how death um, forces people to reconceptualize their whole relationship to their life. And I'm saying that as a, as a healthy, as a healthy man, who's not, you know, death could happen at any moment, but um, there's no, not anything imminent, like I don't have terminal cancer or something like that, or I'm not on my deathbed. I'm trying to find a way to yeah. connect with that honest relationship with death so that I can, so that I can, I can, I don't know, be, 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 I don't know what I'm trying to, to say, to, to be, to be alive every day, to 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 be oriented towards the good, to to bring the new into the world, um, to become more true, to become more real, to become more true and more real than I would have been in an institutional setting. Yeah, because they're dead in the water, <laughs> but that's a different. Story. Yeah, so 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 there's this. <laughs> So there's this this way, and they are then the most because they're part. So I'm trying yeah. to trying to yeah. bring it back to being in time. Heidegger's message that death is not just this existentialist approach to death, but really talking about the way in which death is used by um, the modern project as a concealment and an exploitation. The way this leads to a type of encasement and control ideology and the way in which the way in which a ground would be able to be the thing that can encase and fall apart in case and fall apart I don't know. I'm just trying, trying, trying to think here on the well, on the spot. Yeah, yeah, you know, and in case and fall apart, but um, let's so let's circle back a bit. I I I threw in the dead in the water. The institutions are. Um, why though? I I would I would guess they are because they are no longer part of the human project is because they are part now of the planetary cybernetic digital project but don't you know and that doesn't have to do that much with technology by the way i think you know it's not to say but you're on youtube no um this is more about what what, what the mechanisms are or the processes that are in play where well, as, as you know, with the speaker of academia, speaking from, from my experiences now, there is a complete, not just lack of spontaneity for the most part, but there's a there's there's a disdain for it amongst the, the major actors because the system itself doesn't allow for it, right? If you have a, a completely insane idea, um, you're... The, the, you're not that, that that will never get published it it won't make it won't pass the gatekeepers it won't pass the one or two reviewers who don't take really much time to read 
your stuff anyways, uh, but will only factor it in with what's old, what they already know. So you can see how, how the reviewers are really functionaries of the process of the processes of Gestell. It, it, it's, it's what's unknown is uh, can immediately, and this is where we're back to uh, the similarity and comparing that can be compared with what they already know. And if they know something else, what that reminds them of, then it's either better or lower. And actually, we, you do get published. I mean, explicitly, you do get published very, if anyone is looking for, for hints on how to do this, uh, you will get published when you say on, in a paper, you quote all the right people, of course, which is also gives you a hint at how the cybernetic system works. You say on the one hand, on the other hand, but also. So you have this kind of a fake dialectic uh, that, that also introduces a, a new twisting angle. Um, but it's it's there's never anything that is radically disturbing or so, right? Which is also why did you have these these immediate trends of and, and repetitions endlessly about Heidegger forgets the body, Heidegger forgets this that, and the other, blah, 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 or resurfacing things of, of certain trends. Um, but it, it, as I said before, these are epigonal renaissances, to, to quote Heidegger. They are not something that genuinely can speak to us, which is why it becomes more... Hegel, when Hegel gave lectures, there were hundreds of people in the lecture hall. People wanted to know outside the University of Berlin what he had to say on that day. That does not happen anymore. Um, and that is not just, big, oh, that's bad for the ego of some scholar. No. F philosophy, what is philosophy? Philosophy is the way in which we keep open and access to the world. And if we lose philosophy, and Hegel is aware of this, this is why I don't think that Hegel is this is someone who thinks that we just we become more and more free and that's so wonderful. No. He's very aware of where we are. He says in Section 455, I think, of the encyclopedia, that with the collapse of philosophy, which is currently happening at his time, he says, empirical psychology is arising. That means an associ a free association of ideas and representations, which has no grounding. And that's so a, a non-philosophical age. That's what we're going into, or already are in, is one where we don't have access to the world per se we, we don't know how to make sense of the world that's what people call nihilism the meaning crisis they're looking for sense making tools etc etc and the crisis of the european sciences which has not been solved or even is not even addressed anymore that's ongoing and that means that we lack the categories by which to make sense of the world that was hegel's attempt in the science of logic to to ground the categories in an imminent logic um so yeah and <laughs> okay but, but, but so, i would say this to, to 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 be to be provocative i would say this we're at the point of no return where hegel still sees that we can tie this in with, with aristotelian metaphysics etc after kant i would say no that's that moment has passed we, we there's we have to, that's the alienness maybe that you were describing before, where we still have remnants you, of the shadows that what we do you can mean remember. By we're at but the point the, of, what do, what do you mean by we're at the point of no return? Well, with, the alien? <laughs> I think that's why that shows itself. Yes. That, that it, if, if mm -hmm. to follow what you said, it's it's that that means we we cannot just turn to a new Aristotelian metaphysics and all problems will be solved because it it it's just abstract word games at this point I think I you know what speaks to us yeah. I think and Hegel is there's a reason why Hegel writes this, writes the science of logic which is if you if you want to simplify it is the handbook for categories but there's no one there to 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 continue this, it just collapses. With Hegel's death, that philosophy is over. It, there's no one who passes it on. No one. There's absolutely no one after him. Um, no, there isn't. I mean, and anyone, Husserl is aware of this, the neo Kantians are aware of this, Heidegger was aware of this. Um, and, and the question is though, uh, not why, but the question is if that's the case, 
then um, what is now upon us, we, we can have remnants or certain shadowy memories of, of what was, but it isn't our own. And we're somewhere in between a, 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 such a radical shift in what it means for anything to be um, that if we don't own up to this or look or see what, what's about to strike, then we'll be lost forever. I think we really will lose it. We'll lose our, our humanum. Utterly. I mean, to, to, to mm. say that yeah. human beings, you know, you know, Harari said three years ago in Davos, he said, we will produce brains. It, and there's no outcry. Right, there should be there should, people should be marching in the streets when you hear this, but this doesn't happen. It's just it's we're gone. It, yeah. No one. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. Oh yeah, well yeah, of course we'll produce human beings because why not? We'll need them. No, yeah. th there's there's something so utterly alienating and uncanny about to occur that if we don't wake up, it's it's done. The humanum is gone. That's the trans that's transhumanism for me in a nutshell. It's what that's what it's about. It's to get rid of the human being. Okay. That's some ultimate doom for you tonight, but <laughs> okay. So okay, I'll entertain. Let me no, this is fun. Like I let me, let's let's have okay. fun with the um <laughs> let's have fun with the end of let's have fun with the doom. Because I, I I'm I've because <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was we, approaching this. I, I, no, let's have I, let's have fun with the doom. I could have I could have framed it as like let's approach total doom. That would have been a totally different conversation. But like, so how I was how I was trying to approach? Because I feel like I'm how I was trying to approach this conversation was looking for a ground, and I and I I feel like where we are is there's something so uncanny that we're going to be gone and it's going to be lost forever. So there's no. So I'm not getting a sense that we're going to find a ground, which I mean, it was a pretty ambitious task to be, to, to begin with. So, so <laughs> that's fine. But but so but let's let's play with this. Um, like <coughs> there is this idea in Heidegger that where we find our humanness is in relationship to like an authentic. On a, a profound relationship with death. Now, here's the here's here's the here's my provocative idea. What if the the reason why we need to develop this profound relationship with death is because everything is going to be lost? Something is so uncanny. Something is going to be gone, and that the best we can do is be ethical while we become lost. Like the best, like like while the while the 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 while the otherness or the alienness transforms us, the best we can do is develop a, 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 a an authentic relationship to our own death, develop an authentic relationship to our own lostness. Ethos. I don't, I don't know if there's any I don't yeah yeah I don't know if there's any connection here but in phenomenology yeah. of spirit Hegel says spirit lost its essential life and is now also conscious of this loss So there's the there's this dimension of loss where we don't have yeah. any more our relationship to essential being and not only do we not have this relationship to our essential being anymore, but now we're becoming conscious of this loss. So what if yeah, yeah. we just need to go yeah. in? What if we just need to go into the loss itself? Yeah. I, I th it's just, so you see, you're pointing to the, to the, the heart, the heart hitting Hegel um, to, to, to really the, yeah, the fuck you. Way. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but this is where Hegel hurts, right? And this is this is the, the I think, you know, to speak like a, an academic. Well, there's a Hegel that hasn't been discovered yet. No, I think, but you know, to to make this a bit more. So I think exactly that there are Hegel. I think was very much aware of not not really exactly, but that there is a strangeness that's coming. I mean, I'll, I'll ultimately, you know, he he was friends with. 
with Hölderlin and with Schelling. And Schelling and Hölderlin are utterly dark thinkers um, and poets, of course, also. And so, and yeah, vast differences between the three, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to say that art is something of the past for us now, that that there, there could be an end of history. I mean, is he, that doesn't mean that he thinks the Prussian state is the wonderful end goal of everything. No, I think that he knows that there is something <laughs> of the eschaton. There's something of the eschaton that's spitting already. Uh, and and to go into that loss, I think at the same time, what reintroduces itself is then the moment of turning. Because you can begin to see that the, the cybernetic operations, they are themselves without grounding, which is why you get, so it, leaving ahead a bit, but why does everything have to be so extremely efficient and fast and accelerating? So it doesn't show the, its ungroundedness. Uh, you mentioned the word ethical. The word ethical comes from ethos, which usually translated as character, but ethos can also mean ground. Um, and I think that in the moment of an affirmation of that what is now necessary, that is not fatalism. That in itself opens up something that is outside, beyond that which is currently seemingly prevalent. But let's not forget, it does operate on the level of seeming and appearance mostly and so but through this but we but we don't know the outcome yet that's that's all i'm trying to say is that even if allowing for the alienness or the otherness or this utter strangeness that's unheimliche in german right that's unheimliche meaning um the unhomely the homelessness we don't know the outcome it it, it, it doesn't lead to a utopia or dystopia either um, but that in itself uh, can 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 burst open ways of seeing and being hitherto concealed, and th but but it needs this affirmation of the loss first. I fully agree. Okay, so I think like a lot of that. So like to me, to me. A lot of that overlaps with what I was trying to articulate with absolute knowledge. Like, so like with absolute knowledge, there's this abyssal ground. Like there's this this abyssal ground, there's this 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 pure recognition in in otherness. Um that there is a, a winning of self in utter dismemberment. Like there's a, a, a there's a there's it's a paradoxical win in loss like where you become all of all of substantial identity is torn apart and you find the truth of spirit or something like that and there's also this um way in which i think you have a perspective shift on the alien or the homelessness so like what Spirit before absolute knowledge perceives as alienating in a negative sense. I think spirit in absolute knowledge views the alien as a positive thing. The alien, like the constant alienation, like basically you find it's a paradox where you find home in the alien or you find home in homelessness. This is the, or, the this is or how, I, how I understand uh, what's going on in, in some aspects of the, the preface. So it's it's yeah. I think that there's there's a way there's a way in which this gives me um a lens or a a way of of thinking that can be comfortable in the alien in the otherness but also you know but I would I would I would say through homelessness so it doesn't remain there because that that in itself becomes its its own so when you leave the cave and you keep staring at the sun, you're not you're not enlightened. You go blind, um, and that in its so there is something in Catholic German uh, mysticism. There's a, 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 a thought by a word by Master Eckhart, which perhaps rings true today. Still, 
he says, why do you go out in order to return home? But in order to be able to return home, we home, we need to know first or be aware that we have gone out. Is that we are now in in the alien, if you like, if you want to use that word. But I wouldn't I like you know it's word. sorry? I do like that word. <laughs> which which the word? Alien. The, alien. Uh, the alien. But I, I wanna I wanna say my 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 grandmother while we were growing up she would always say uh, let's go out so we can come back home nice well she was uh she was a, <laughs> a she was a rebirth of Eckhart. yeah there you go but this but but, okay. but yeah so the, no go on so, the, so 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 what so how would you relate the cave allegory um, which you're starting to point to now to to this situation does does that does that give a different perspective on it on on us today on the homelessness on, on the homelessness on the lostness yeah so Does to me the whole story so give a different perspective the question is of course you know so a home a house can be can become a prison um a home does not a house doesn't need to be a home um just like the cave is described as an abode by plato but one that's cave-like and prison-like. And the necessity to leave is so that there's, there's not this, there's no description. The, the story is not uh, one of wondrous enlightenment, right? One of the dangers of our time is, and this has to do with the generational issue also, is that, as you know, there are a couple of people who just won't shut up about enlightenment values. Um, who have never heard of Adorno or <laughs> <laughs> you know that what were you in the 20th century um but uh the the issue that 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 this kind of talk about enlightenment values which of course also has to do with the leaving of the cave does is have you ever used your own understanding to refer to Kant to overcome yourself uh, what's the what's the english your self inflicted um uh unmündigkeit uh what's what's the english um from what is enlightenment um well it doesn't come to me so you'll have to bear with the german it's absolutely the unmündigkeit um that we haven't overcome but just because say the enlightenment happened doesn't mean or a reason has been declared a goddess it doesn't mean that the following generations are just guided by these tremendous values so-called forevermore as a superstructure there needs to be again and again, and now we're back to, to the title also, grounding. A grounding is not once and for all absolute timeless. Um, and in that sense, an alienation to make this less spooky or weird can also come from a, a world that is no longer ours, um, but that is dealing purely with semblances and reflections but not anything that's genuinely experienced. The leaving of the cave as described by Plato is one that's necessitated. There's, there's no grand marching up. Finally, I'm free. It's full of suffering and pain. Um, especially leaving the cave is utterly painful. The, seeing the sun is impossible. Looking at even seeing anything that's say real, is impossible because it's too bright one has to he has to spend the one who's been liberated or freed has to spend the night first in order to be able to see shadows the next day or mirror reflections um yeah i love this no i, lo I, I love this um i mean a few things is i do and then he has to return home he has way... to return back into the cave sorry well that's okay um, I do think that the way you approach Plato's cave is a nice counter, uh, to, you know, this, this idea that I guess you'd say it's a new idea. Am I, am I losing connection? I can always hear you. I, I'm here. Okay. 
You're here. So yeah. I, I think it's a it's a it's a perfect antidote to this idea of the wondrous enlightenment or the new age spirituality of like you know, just you know this endless positivity of enlightenment or 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 living for your bliss and and stuff like this. Um, that yeah, but also all of all of Western liberalism. Also, yeah. Well, Western liberalism is is regulated by the the pleasure principle. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was just laughing because yeah, in agreement, in agreement, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it totally, totally regulated by pleasure, and that's. I mean, I think that's the that's the religion of individualism and liberalism. It's just immediate gratification and immediate pleasure, but the 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 leaving the cave as something that's painful, the leaving the cave as something that's um, a repetitive process. And and also one that is uh, an enlightenment that's that's in some sense impossible because you can't just stay with the sun you have to return to the cave, uh, and yeah. that it, and that that is a difficult process. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I I think that that's kind of where, in some sense, I find myself in in some way is not knowing how to engage with the world of appearances but at the same time recognizing that engaging with the world of appearances is necessary yeah and yeah. that recoiling away from the world of appearances is not the truth that being in the world of appearances is the truth, even though it looks like the world of appearances is going to become radically other than what my original presuppositions of it were. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. I feel like the world of appearances, the world that I, the world that you, appears to me yeah. is going to become radically different. That's okay. I can, mm -hmm. um, engage with that world of appearances by developing more and more self practices that put me in touch with death have a divine relationship with with the non-available yeah yeah and that in that i can um hopefully appear to others as a being oriented towards uh the good that's that's trustworthy that's truthful that's and so forth yes and precisely because it's through these moments of pain uh a disclosure that's painful that at the same time covers over something else in walking up and leaving having to leave the return is one of compassion by the way so it's, it's explicitly stated by plato that he returns because of compassion into the cave and is then faced with death. So Plato doesn't use the word Thanatos. He doesn't say he's faced with death, but he's faced with being killed by the others. If they got a hold of him because, well, because he will point them to something that they wouldn't want to hear. Namely, that their home is a prison they're dealing with mere shadows which they wouldn't even be able to conceptualize or understand and you said something else with the world of appearances there's there is no being without shining or seeming or appearing shine und sein in german is so shine is seeming or appearing and sein is being that not only phonetically very close they are interrelated. The cave cannot be without its outside, and its outside cannot be without the cave. Um, th there is no appreciation of what is in its full being without that which is only of a shadow. And this should also, though, give us pause that being itself is rare, is not everywhere to be found. It must be unearthed, cherished, and then also it cannot be controlled. We think that we have found what the human being is by decoding the genome. No, we have not. That's a momentary imagination of the beingness of humanness, 
which is you know reaching levels of abstraction, of abstraction that shouldn't even be possible but anyways and at the same time they do not disclose what you you know people do this thing where they they get their whatever their ancestry checked or so <laughs> genetically and i'm 27.325 percent this and blah, blah 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 that's not who you are that's yeah, that discloses nothing that just covers over everything you could be um and it, it precisely for that reason that it, it gives you a a seeming of of what you had so you see how this plays with the past right this 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 technique it plays with the past and projects something into the future but it's not genuine what's much more genuine is listen you know, listen to what your parents have to say or you, in your case your your grandmother who used to, did you just remember it, where she said um let's go out in order to come home again that's much more who you are than a stupid genetic test can ever tell you about who you are um and th that's we're so so you see but we're looking for who we are we're looking to 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 find a hole to find something that holds us that gives us a ground precisely with this oh i am 50 percent uh polish and 50 percent german or so or or something else it, it, but that's not that doesn't ground us it's a momentary representation and it but it doesn't actually found or ground us in any in any profound or meaningful way uh you know, no one goes to their grave saying well at least i knew that you know <laughs> that i'm 22 percent french um no you you won't that's not um <laughs> it's not really i think what uh what what would be there? I didn't finish the other point on, on seeming and being on shine und sein in German, which is this: um, just because you have found who you think you are, doesn't mean that this will remain so. I give you an example, and this is an example I have learned myself from a friend of mine. His name is uh, Max Gottschlich. He's a professor of philosophy in Austria, and his example is that. Uh, of two actors an actress and an actor on a stage who have to pretend that they are in a relationship but they're not i mean they're not in private life but they are on stage so they put on a certain appearance a certain seeming of intimacy but in doing so let's say over several months of rehearsal and then also going on stage doing this for a live audience they actually through faking or making, making appear the intimacy where there is none this mere seeming can turn into being they can fall in love with each other that mm -hmm. can happen so you could there's it, there's no clear-cut distinction where this occurs or so but there is a relationship between seeming and being and on the other hand and this is a different example is this we, we do say about people well no she's become a sh a shadow of her former self he's he's really no longer how i remember him do you know how we say this sometimes even about ourselves maybe so we also can fall off from what we have been which still lingers on as a shadow as the idiom says but no longer in its full we're not fully in that self anymore so what is can fall prey to mere seeming and what only seems to be can become being uh and that again so we're never just grounded once and for all if we just speak about this in terms of this very you know specific individual yeah. sense we're never just fully grounded and once i've arrived there i can know there's, there's, yeah. there's a continuous task to be open also and close let be welcome something take it and let go continuously again and again i love that yeah. i love that absolutely um i also like your emphasis on that that being is rare and it must be unearthed and it cannot be controlled um and and i think it 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 requires this 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 radical openness um 
this radical openness and this radical yeah um like you really have to be sensing and perceiving and present and so forth in order to to stumble upon it but then also if you do if you are so lucky to stumble upon it um yeah. to sort of hold it lightly um and and to let it go when its time has come um i'm i am mindful i am mindful of the time so i guess i would ask maybe if 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 there's anything I don't know. I, it's 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 hard. It's always hard to to find a way to to close because there's just so much that's been said. Um, but if there's anything on your mind um, that is related to this topic of death and world grounding that you, but you can see some, leave the, yeah, the to, with. To you know, death, death. But no, it's, it's not just about dying. It's if if death is one dimension, not the only one, but one dimension in which we indwell, then we are under threat from the non-available. But there's also a gift of that. So, and you just said it, you know, to hold on to it for a time and be um, mindful, playful with what's being granted and given, and then we let go of it again when it's necessary this has to do with us and with others too you can you cannot love i mean first this the silly example if you cannot make anyone fall in love with you you cannot force someone to love you uh you cannot you, and you cannot if you if your will is to change someone that you supposedly love then you're outside the scope of it also you're with you're within an attempt to control um but you're not letting someone be and unfold. Um, I agree totally. And, and I think that uh, this, you know, gives us hints at how we can remain human, um, and how we can also find answers. And this is this is the work to be done, right? I think if if this is, as I said before, we're young enough. This is our sin. Yeah. Yeah. This is ours. Or it might be it might ours. be ours. We might have to share it with the aliens, but it's ours for now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> no, I, I, well, okay. I, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think I think I yeah. think the work I think the I think the work to be done has to do with with being the type of being that can be with be with love. In, in yeah. I don't know maybe that's too cheesy but 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 love not in like the idea, not love in like the cheesy romantic sense only love is also involving really being there for the other and can be painful and and can rip you apart so and yeah. it can't be controlled and so it, exactly so in, so in this moment where there seems to be an attempt to have utmost control over everything even just to take the stance of saying no. But an affirmative no, right? You know, think think about yeah, that. Yeah, an affir affirmative no. Yeah, yeah, uh, a no that affirms and that at the same time disempowers, right? So, there's there's someone who comes to my courses sometimes. His name is Drew. He runs a chuchitsu um, school in Texas, and uh, I have no, I don't know anything about chuchitsu, but I remember one of his talks. This was uh, in a idleness or so a course on idleness and leisure blah, blah, blah. but he gave a talk on jiu-jitsu and said if in jiu-jitsu you're being you know you have your opponent on top of you and you're pushing up let's say so this is this is me and this is the opponent and he's pushing me down and i push against it he's going to use that pressure to to win but if i find a way of withdrawing somehow just a little bit I might not win overall, but I can. I, this is not the end of the fight just yet. So to to be antithetical or resisting or so that's maybe not the right approach at this point, but to find ways of of freely withdrawing, full of and joy, full of joy, um, and 
and human spirit, esprit. Uh, esprit also in you know in dialogue, as Nietzsche says, there's no esprit left in in in, in conversation. Um, and that that's strangely enough, though, possible again, not only. So I don't I don't I don't advocate saying we'll just all meet on Zoom forever. No, we do need to meet in real life. And the reason why you and I can have this extended dialogue is I think also because we've met and trust each other because we've taken long walks through the cold. I think it's a, it's very important in, in North London. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, this medium allows for something that is in in, in a certain sense open. Um you know, two or three people will listen to the whole thing. It's not a 20-minute presentation that you give at some stupid conference that no one's ever going to listen to. It, it, it's ex this is experimental. None of this is set in stone. We're working something out as we go. That's also very important maybe to mention this, right? That this is not... Uh, that we're working something out as we go. But this is possible thanks to this temporal openness and spatial dislocation also off um the internet so it can bring something about if it doesn't stay purely on the consumptive level so you have to become active yourself i think that's really crucial and then then the possibilities are exuberant they're they're insane they're incredible what's going i think what's going to be possible in five what's going to be accepted also in five or ten years when it comes to studying this is only just beginning um that you know, titles will matter not at all. No one will care whether yeah. you have a PhD or not. What people will care about is what you've got to say, whether it makes sense, and you can argue articulate coherently in different forms. So in writing, but also speaking. I think writing will be very important if you can write coherently, yeah. uh, speaking publicly, and also dialoguing, because that requires a certain openness to the other. Right, but I. I have to follow you. You have to follow me. If we don't, the whole thing breaks down. It doesn't make sense. So, and that so it does come back, I think, to the old form here as well. And I use the word form specifically. There's an old form of the dialogue that is, I think, returning in a good sense. So it's not all lost just yet. No. Almost. Well, no, no, <laughs> I'm no, not, not, no, it's, it's not, it's not all off. And, and, and I, I th and I think that we can, we can, hopefully we did something to point towards loss, the non-available, um, developing some relationship to death, whether it's developing a relationship with loss, failure, um, death, what's not available, what's not controllable, developing yeah. some relationship to that, which is positive, which is not seen as um, I don't know, somehow uh, something to be eradicated or something to be eliminated, but rather something to be, um, you know, warming up to, uh, comfortable in, because I, you know, I, I would say that we, we're the type of beings that, that can, can, can do that and, and can, yeah. and can become more real doing that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'd let, I just want to maybe summarize for, for the, the viewers, um, that that Johannes and I discussed uh, death and uh, world grounding. Um, Johannes's work, uh, I will leave it in the description. You can check out uh, both his uh, online academy, his YouTube channel, and his book on um, on Heidegger uh, and death and being. I think we tried to approach in this conversation. Um, some relationship between the human and death as holding a special place or holding a special uh, relationship um, that cultivating some ethical relationship to this dimension of being um, is essential and not just uh, in the abstract, but for our time concretely now. Um, and that, uh, you know, there's a lot of weird things going on. And a lot of weird things could be happening this century, but also a lot of possibilities. And I think that we're both open to experimenting. Uh, I know I'm open to experimenting with my being in, in that in that direction. So thank you so much, Johannes. Thank you, Dr. Last. Um, one final remark. <laughs> we will, we will yes, of course, please. we will, of course, uh, continue this. 
so um, yes please you'll 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 be coming on we'll we'll because that will go into your work uh because that ties into some of some of the things that we've touched on and uh, we'll do this maybe yeah. oh yeah whenever mid january or so whenever it's good for you you hop you hop on my channel and uh all right we'll continue there sounds good, sounds I'll, good. I'll i'll get i'll get the i'll get the wine bottle yeah, let's <laughs> excellent you get french wine very good good yeah thank all right. you all right thank you, I'm, I'm i'm i'm